actually can endure to ocean specters <laughs> after, you know, as tourists. And they say, this is why I have a job. <laughs> We are in South Pass City, Wyoming, and this is an old gold mining town from the, around the 1800s, end of the 1800s. Yes. And we just did a walking tour of the town here, which is pretty cool. Uh huh. They have quite a few of the buildings left. Yeah, and some of them have old pictures and such in them that you can right. walk through and look at. And it looks like, you know, they've been refurbished, and, uh, you know, you can take a look. Some are uh, individuals. Cottages or yep. homes. It's the stores, saloons. Yes. The yeah. restaurant. Yeah. And we also got to take a private tour of the gold mine uh, processing. Yes. And that was, that was fascinating. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. And so we're going to show you all that video now. Okay. So this is the Carissa gold mine and this gold mine kind of kicked off in 18, what is it, 18 1867 but it pretty much panned out in by 1870 by that time 3,000 people had come here to look for their fortune in gold and then the town just pretty much died after that now they did um, reopen the mine in the 1900s until uh, 1929 using more modern technology and was able to find more gold but it's interesting that um, you know, this is another case of where a town people rush to a town because of you know mining and then you know the mines just didn't pan out to for the long term and the the towns boomed and then crashed yeah because it's always hard to find uh, you know, find where those sites are because they don't list them. Yeah, you usually start off with a hole in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, so th this is what's called the discovery shaft here at the Carissa. Um, and discovery of gold here at South Pass was really tied to the immigrant trails, particularly for the um, California gold rush. Mm -hmm. um, the immigrant trails are just about eight miles to the south of us, whereas we're sitting right now. Um, so California, 1849, went right through here. Those gold panners, were, they were probably prospecting as they went. Uh -huh. right. um, so what they did is they kind of marked things down um, on maps and said they found a little color in their pans, particularly on the Sweetwater River, which is down mm -hmm. in, um, um, right there by the trail. And they, it wasn't enough to stop them. Um, it wasn't enough that California was doing so great mm -hmm. that they just decided, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to keep on going. What happened though is Civil War hap came in um, in the 1860s. Um, a lot of those miners that were out in California either were conscripted into the army or they joined up. Um, and what happened is after the Civil War to kind of phase people back into day-to-day -day life, they actually sent a lot of um, soldiers out to the forts that were here. So Fort Laramie and Fort Bridger, which are, is kind of down in the southern part of the state, right along those trail corridors. And Fort Bridger was um, a place that they sent a group of um, soldiers to. And they just basically said, okay, you're stationed here, but we're going to encourage you to prospect. We're going to encourage you to set up um, ranches, farms, things like that. So they would give them time to do that. So they'd heard about the gold that those people, when they were coming through in 1849, um, they had heard about that, read about it, so they turned around and started to come up here and backtrack. Because hmm. when that gold erodes out of the, out of, um, off the hillsides and off the mountains, it actually is heavy, so it always works its way down to the lowest spot. So they started to backtrack up the sweet water. Um, and started out at the Sweetwater, they backtracked up Willow Creek, which is the creek that runs now through town. Of course, uh. nothing was there. Um, they backtracked up this drainage that we're on right now, and they found this quartz vein um, that you can see sticking out of this hillside here. Um, 
of course it was just this area that we're in right now has all been excavated um, so it would have been a line just running on top of the hillside mm -hmm. and they probably found visible gold um, when they got here and it's what it's called is is it's in, a, in an eroded matrix is what they call it and it would have looked a lot like this um, this isn't from South Pass City but oh, it's yeah. it is an example of probably what yeah. they were finding mm -hmm. um, they got really excited. They spent most of the summer up here. Um, they uh, went back to Fort Bridger and they did the stupidest thing they could possibly do. They told people. Yep. They oh. bragged. Yep. And um, yep. And they went to the commissary. They had a few too many. Yeah, exactly. And so they set their claim. They set this in 1867 in June. It was called the Cariso Load at the time. But by the next year, the following spring, by the following June, um, there was four soldiers originally that were involved in it. The, the next year, there were literally a thousand miners on the assault. Oh. Um, so it had gotten into a Chicago newspaper and it had just went wild. Um, so they still started to work and they probably came back with more mm -hmm. that following year um but of course there was competition oh, um, yeah. and so this whole hillside it's pretty barren now and there's not a lot of people of course um but as we walk across this hillside you'll see lots of closed shafts mm -hmm. that kind of indicates how many people were here and that sort of thing some of them knew what they were doing these guys did know what they were doing they uh -huh. were experienced miners mm -hmm. but some of them didn't like this one that you can see right over there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we know who he was his name was anton stubo he was a czech immigrant um and he dug an 80 foot deep shaft and, and he oh, wasn't even it? on a quartz van. No, was it? <laughs> oh, no. At least he didn't so, fall into it. Yeah, no, no, he, he didn't, he, but he didn't know what he was doing. He was a really good restaurateur, so he oh. went and opened restaurants <laughs> down in South Pass when it was booming. So, um, at that time period, the place was busy. Um, of course, South Pass just sprung up overnight. There was about 2,000 to 2,500 people there in, in South Pass City itself. About 300 buildings, um, oh, wow. and it boasted 14 saloons and one church. Oh. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> Everybody went to that church. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it was a busy, you know, classic boom town. Is what it was. It only lasted um, for about two to three years. That oh. first rush. Um, because it was all people that were doing handwork and believe it or not this shaft was dug by hand so it it's picks it shovels a little bit of blasting powder and things like that and they would pull the ore out crush it in big mortars and pestles and and then gold pan what they'd crushed huh. They did, they went, they kind of went crazy. Um, there were not a lot of people that made a lot of money. Mm. The people that made money were of course the, the businesses in yeah. town. Oh yeah, like that. The yeah. Saloons, the, yeah. You know, the, mm -hmm. the saloons did really good business, the mercantiles, <laughs> things uh -huh. like that. So. Huh. They did turn around and sell a lot of um, these claims eventually. Um, as as the surface gold started to wear off, they started to consolidate them and would sell them as blocks of these claims. And what eventually happened is by the 1880s and 90s, um, a Chicago logging magnate um, had bought up the property, and he was he honestly was friends with like the Rockefellers and things like uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. um, and he wanted a gold mine just like his friends had. Oh. <laughs> um, so he, he started looking um, for a gold mine and he found one in Wyoming and, and he was going to try and really seriously make some work on it. But it was a lot harder than he oh. had expected. Um, <laughs> and that an lot, office job? Yeah, no, a lot more expensive. Uh -huh. uh, they did sink the operating shaft which is underneath us right now. Um, it is a, um, they call it a double compartment shaft. Oh, um, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> and what that means is there is a place for ore to come up and down um, on ore cars <laughs> and on a, on a hoisting system. And then there's a separate side for the men to go underground. Oh. So, um, it's traditionally they were they didn't like running the equipment because of course that costed money 
Um, so um, they wouldn't fire up the steam boilers if you were just working down there, so you climbed ladders. Mm -hmm. um, so your morning commute would be, you know, 45 <laughs> stories worth of ladders. Mm -hmm. um, and oh. your oh. evening commute would be the even worse. Oh. Yeah. After a whole day down there digging <laughs> and you gotta climb up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this flashlight's doing like next to nothing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, uh, I oh. see a little landing right there. Yep. After a, that. <laughs> it, every 10 feet there was a landing uh. and a ladder. A ladder <laughs> oh. and, a, and they would crawl up and down that. Sometimes they would ride it if the systems were up and running. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Uh, day. Yeah, if that was running. There were three <laughs> kind of boom periods here. There was that of that '68 period, that um, 1880, 1890 time period. Then there was 1929. So. Um, the buildings that we're going to be going through are 1929 and um, the 1940s as well. Oh, okay. They changed technology really quickly. You'd think they would be really slow to get new tech out here in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they did things pretty oh. quickly. Equipment um, that we have in here. They is the nice thing about it is is it a lot of it has stayed. We have brought in some pieces of equipment as we've done restoration work and things like that, but most of it is original to the side. This is the hoist, and what it is is basically a big fishing rail. Yeah. Um, it goes out the top. Of course, if this building goes to the top of the head frame, which we were just under, and then comes down, and it's an elevator that goes up and down the mine shaft. Um, the but, but it's basically just like a basket. That they're, mm -hmm. they're, yep. I mean, it's not like an elevator where it's on a track or anything. They're just mm -hmm. dangling a basket it's up and down that yep. hole. Uh, there's, um, they would use several different mechanisms to keep it from spinning yeah. and things like that because if you didn't use, uh, they'd, they'd have a track that it would run down a little bit that would keep it from rotating. Um, or they'd have a big, there was a big square thing on the end that would bump against the side <laughs> to keep it from um, right. rotating. rotating you know, so. It's called the hoist house, of course, because of the hoist is in it. Um, there was usually about one guy that was working in here. He was one of the best paid um, people at the Carissa um, because he was basically, you know, he was in charge of the main opening, you know, that this is the only way in and the only way out. He was a pretty important person. And at this mine, if you talk to him, you'd get fired. Really? Oh, for distracting him. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> the, um, was to break up the rock um, and get it out and get out the, particularly the good ore. That actually, if you've, it's not real dynamite, but it's, oh, it, it, is, it is weighted correctly and it's wrapped like dynamite would. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no <laughs> one of the things that's interesting about kind dynamite yeah. is that yeah. most people don't know is it freezes really at a higher temperature than normal, um, about 40 degrees, um, oh. it will freeze and destabilize. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the miners that were packing it underground uh, ah. to get it to their blasting locations would wear it in vests against their bodies oh, wow. to keep, keep it, it warm. warm. Oh. So, so. They'd use mm. these drills to drill holes to pack the dynamite in, and they're, they've got, where's my little one? It's right there. Um, they've got um, carbide bits on them, and they would actually pump through these jack legs um, water right. um, to keep the dust down so they wouldn't get nearly as much um, silicosis um, mm. and that kind of thing. So. Mm. Tremendous amount of work. The, the light one, this one, it only weighs about 75 pounds. Yeah. This oh one's my goodness. About 150, <laughs> and this stoper over here is about 250. Wow. wow. And they would position them in and drill their blasting holes and pack them full of dynamite oh, and yeah. blast. Right. My kind of job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, Dan, watch your head. Watch your head. It's, it's really short here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, this is the Carissa Mill building. These um, gold mills are all about crushing up the rock, breaking it up that comes out of the mine and getting the gold that might be in the ore out of it. So what they did is they pushed that ore from the head frame and that trestle we walked across. Mm -hmm. There'd actually be a teenage kid. That was his first job in the mining industry would be to take that one of those big ore cars loaded full of ore and he'd push it across that trestle by hand. Oh um, 
dump it into this big orbin that we're in, we walked under, mm -hmm. um, and it would fall down onto this conveyor and come into this big crusher, and it's um, what they call a gyratory crusher. And it's basically like a big mortar and pestle. Mm -hmm. And it just sits there and grinds, and it takes in ore that's about grapefruit size, mm -hmm. and that's the ore they were getting out of the mine, is this kind of purplish mm -hmm. gray quartz. Mm -hmm. It's best to think about this place as you're going after microscopic stuff. Mm -hmm. They were not able to generally see big chunks of gold in their ore. Um, so the whole point is get it as small as you can. It had come out of this crusher about golf ball size. Um, this belted mechanism would pick up that ore and take it up to another ore bin where it would be fed down to some more crushers down below us. And we'll go look at those here in a second. Two seconds. Come on, Dad. They do it. Um, so that ore that we were just talking about is up in that bin. Above your heads is where it would have been. It would have come out on a conveyor belt into this crusher. And um, it's called a jaw crusher and it's pretty self-explanatory. It just chews up the ore. It's two metal plates that crush it down to about sugar cube size. Golf ball to sugar cube. Then this, um, it feeds out of that into this bin on this ball mill, is what this is called. And it is full of eight tons of those, um, basically cannonballs. I saw those on the other side. Uh-huh, yeah. 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 It's, <laughs> it sits there and spins. Um, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it takes it um, from that sugar cube size down into um, face powder consistency. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. This is where the chemistry starts. They also mm -hmm. would start to feed through some of the piping systems. They would actually start to feed um, sodium cyanide. Okay. Um, so mm -hmm. the cyanide is, mm -hmm. is a part of the recovery process and we'll talk more about that here in a second. It actually gets wet here, that crusher that we were just up against, that was dry. Um, so again, it's like those drills, if you keep it wet, it keeps the dust down. But it also helps move it along too. So, um, and I'll turn these on for you, but when this thing is on, you cannot hear anything. Yeah, so oh. I basically yeah. kind of explain it first and then uh -huh. turn it on. Mm -hmm. So um, it comes out of this crusher. If it's been crushed fine enough, it'll actually fall through this sieve that's on the end. Mm -hmm. okay. And it'll come down through these tracks and it'll come into this machine right here. And mm -hmm. it's called a jig, a mineral jig. Uh -huh. And it basically is a jacuzzi. Um, <laughs> what it does is, is it has pulses of water in it and the pulses are pressured enough that they will lift anything that's not gold and move it on and they're not strong enough for the gold to pat so it'll fall through oh. there and they would collect the stuff down in the bottom um, there's a collection port and it was called black sands and it basically was iron with some gold that would be mixed into it again microscopic you really can't see it you got to <laughs> chemically treat everything um, that light stuff would, would get washed off into this trough. They didn't give up on it though because it might be, there might it be, it might have some gold in it still. So this classifier spins and it picks that stuff up and it forces it back up to the top where they'd feed it back into the ball mill to be crushed again. Mm -hmm. Comes out, gets processed through again. They don't give up on it there. They'd actually move over to this machine. Um, what it does, this group of machines, they're all the same machine, there's five of them. What it is, is it's basically like a blender. Um, it's called a flotation cell. And they would turn around and they would take a, um, it was a pine sap and a xanthate is what the chemicals were. And where that machine gets it to sink, this one will actually get the gold to float. It's a surfactant. Yeah, uh -huh. yep, you got it. And um, there's, there's actually some, some parallels with big industrial photography and the chemistry that goes on. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, and the froth that comes on these mm -hmm. would be just kind of a slightly metallic looking, like, like a lead-like silver. And it gets slapped off by these beaters that would knock it off, and then they would collect that and 
process it later. So, so I'll turn this stuff on for you for a few minutes. You're welcome to walk around and look. give up on this stuff. Those, that group of machinery right there was getting about 85% of their gold recovery. Um, they didn't give up on it. They sent stuff back into the ball mill again, they crushed again, and then they would pump it across this. It's called a Wilfrey table. And basically what it is, is a big gold pan. Yeah. Um, and so anything that's light, that isn't gold, washes off of that edge down there. Um, it gets fed back into the ball mill to be crushed again. Um, if it has the potential for gold or black sands, it'll actually work its way down this edge and fall off of these routers and would fall into a bucket to be collected. Um, and this was um, maybe another 5% of the recovery. In the, the chemicals that they use, these, mm -hmm. these big tanks, this is, um, it's called a thickener tank, um, and it's 65,000 gallons, and there's actually one right here, there's three behind it, and then there's four more down on the bottom level yeah. of the building. They'd feed whatever came off of that table into this um, device, and that paddle sits in there and it slowly spins. They feed more cyanide to it to get it to about 1% cyanide um, and what happens with cyanide water and gold is the gold will dissolve um, and it, it's a lot like silver nitrate yep. um, and so what it'll do is it'll turn around and it will dissolve in, into solution become slightly lighter and it'll come and it'll flow off the, into this trough on this big tank into this tank behind you and there's that filter is pulled out and um, they would suck that solution through that filter. It's covered in diatomaceous earth. Um, and that gold is in solution. You can't see it. It's like sugar dissolved in hot tea. Um, they would suck it through that and feed it into this tank that's up above you right here and this one right there. Um, the solution that's in these things is perfectly clear. You can't, there's nothing. It just looks like water. Um, and they had in each one of these um, tanks is a big pipe tree um, and off of that pipe tree is, is, is these fittings just a cotton sock that hangs off of it and what they had in these socks in the inside was ground zinc um, and when that solution with the gold dissolved passes through it the cyanide likes the zinc more than it does the gold. So it dissolves the zinc, drops the gold, and takes the zinc out through the sock. Um, so it's pretty amazing. It's, yeah, it's complex, yeah. really complex. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, and they take those socks um, at the end of a cycle, which would be about every 10 days. They never shut anything down. That's why they had two of them. They would leave one running, mm -hmm. and then the other one would um, be taken down and serviced. They take the socks out, and the way it's kind of described is it would be kind of, kind of a metallic scum that was mm -hmm. on the inside of the sock. Mm -hmm. They bring it over to this sink, and this piping system comes straight out of that cyanide system. They'd wash the socks into a crucible. Um, if you knocked the crucible over or something like oh. that, Ooh. it drained back oh. into yeah, the system so they'd catch it. Yeah. There's this trough on the floor that if you dropped it here, that all drains back into the system. So, yeah. so if you lost anything, you messed something up, it'd get back. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is they'd come over here. Sorry, get here. 
I'm going to meet you later this afternoon and let you free. <laughs> I was wondering, it's like, how are you going to get that out of here? <laughs> a bird net, actually. Oh. With the size of a building, we spend a lot of time chasing birds. <laughs> they put that crucible in there. They would um, take it up to uh, 2,000 degrees. They'd pour off any impurities. Um, then they'd take it back up to 2,500 degrees, and they had a mold, just like that. And they would pour it back out, and that's and what... And hopefully, this is what you get. That was what they were sending out to the mint. They were sending out 80 to 100 ounce bars. So now, is this real mint. or is this just No, gross? that's lead. <laughs> I was like, this looks like it might be painted. Yeah, somebody would be escaping with it. Uh, oh, that's yeah. heavy. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> And of course, the gold standard was in place back then, so it was $32 an ounce. You had to sell it to the government. Mm -hmm. um, oh. And of course, nowadays, uh, this would be, where are we at? I think we were $1,800 last week per yeah. ounce. Oh, yeah. so, um, so, totally different price mm -hmm. change. And believe it or not, they would take that. It's just hilarious. Um, you'd think they'd ship it out in a Brinks truck or something like that. They would take that bar down to the post office in South Pass City, no. put it in really? a box, insure it with the U.S. mail, and send it to the Denver Mint. If it got lost <laughs> in the mail, it was the government's problem. Oh my gosh. Wow. So, depending on their, um, how well their ore was doing, they would get one of those about every 10 days. Um, and, you know, that was really good production. Mm -hmm. Good production up here was about a quarter of an ounce per ton of ore processed. Mm. Oh. So, so they were getting about 95% recovery? Uh, yeah, they were getting up closer to 98, 98. actually. There's an, uh, this yeah, is no, another piece of machinery so that they would take um, the, the black sands that I was talking about. This is actually what it looks like. Uh, is this stuff and um, it looks like sand with metal in it mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and this one is a particularly <laughs> kind of scary machine they would take that black sand they would pour it in there um, there's scrap metal in here old broken um, steel balls pieces of bolts mm -hmm. nuts anything that would kind of act as a you know as a abrasive agent throw that in there, and then these metal cylinders were full of mercury. <laughs> um, this is one that's empty, um, and when they're full, they're about 90 pounds. Mm -hmm. That one's weighted so that you could feel how heavy it is, but mm -hmm. it's about 90 pounds. They pour that in there, the mercury and the gold will stick together, mm -hmm. and amalgam is what it's called. They process that for a few hours. They pop a cork on the bottom of this. That mercury and amalgam would go blop out. <laughs> they take it, put it into the blast furnace, and burn the mercury off. Ah, <laughs> any bad <bed> hitters? <laughs> they actually they're incredibly frugal. Um, they um, had a system where they could recapture it and cause it to recondense. And and they would reclaim the mercury out of it. Wow! Um, so I'm just thinking these people probably made it to maybe forty. <laughs> so I was just thinking. Yeah, <laughs> they died early. I mean, of something. Um, well, you know, <laughs> if something. you remember, mad as a hatter, mm -hmm. yeah. that was because they were using mercury mm -hmm. in their process. So yeah. I was wondering how yeah. many mad hatters did you have? It was they were remarkably the people that we talked to that actually worked in this facility were in their nineties. Really? So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. So. The thing that they said was the most dangerous thing that they remembered the most was you could not touch the pipes. Hmm. Um, because yeah, you, yeah, because yeah. you would get electrocuted. Oh. So, um, well, maybe they didn't know what they were dealing with chemically. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. they, they did actually, which was amazing. There's um, in this bunker that's kind of over here, um, it was full of lime. And the water here is naturally acidic. Um, and so when you put that sodium cyanide um, into the water and there's a little bit of acidity in the water, it turns into death chamber gas. Yes. Um, so oh they would God. bring the pH ah, down. The farther oh, this so. goes, the worse it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. 
<laughs> uh, like I said, when I have had OSHA people come through on the on the on the public tours, and they're like, "This is why I have a job." <laughs> and I'm like, "Don't look at it as a workplace right now." Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it is. It's it's an amazingly complex building. We've done in terms of maximum production. Um, was about 80 tons a day. So that 12 year old was going back and forth 160 times. So pushing a ton of uh, uh, work. So. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tour of the Carissa Mine. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up. If you're new to our channel and you'd like to follow along in our adventures, please subscribe, hit that bell for notification. And hey, we will see you down the road. Take care, everybody. Let's not waste time or take this slow. We've got miles behind us and miles to go. So let's just break this down to the simplest truth.